Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back um, to our series about we're asking the tough questions. And today we're going to be asking one of the most difficult questions to answer, and that is why suffering? And I don't really need to go into a, a bunch of statistics for you because I'm sure that many of you are familiar with suffering, whether you know somebody or you have a family member who's experienced suffering or you yourself are experiencing suffering on a daily basis. The fact is that suffering is something that nobody likes and we all have this moral compass inside of us and we know that it's not good. And we always come to the question, why? Why am I suffering? Why do I see the suffering in the world? And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, this morning. And to use a, a very lighthearted example, how many of you guys like going to the dentist? Mm. Hands are coming up all over this place. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. Okay. Nobody <laughs> likes going to the dentist. It's just this thing that we do not like going to do. I'm pretty sure dentists don't even like going to the dentist. So, um, But the fact is that we all go to the dentist, and whether you are a person that does not take very good care of your teeth, you brush once a day, you never floss, you drink lots of pop, you drink lots of coffee, you go to the dentist, and you're going to reap the benefits of what you've sown. You are going to have to go through all the drillings and all the fillings and you're going to have to suffer in that dentist chair for uh, it feels like hours where they have all these tools inside your mouth and they ask you all these questions and you're supposed to answer these questions but they don't want you to talk at the same time. I'm sure you guys have heard that joke before. That's not an original joke. <laughs> so, but we all have to suffer at the dentist or for you who take really good care of your teeth. I recently went to the dentist and I had four fillings. And since then, I have been taking the best care of my teeth that I have ever taken in my entire life. I've been brushing twice a day, mm -hmm. I've been flossing, I've been trying to stay away from sodas, you know, chewing all the gums after I, after I eat foods to like neutralize the acidity in my mouth. And, but the fact is, I have another dentist appointment that I have to go to. I'm not gonna get away from this, from this truth that I have to go to the dentist. And suffering is kind of the same way, where w no matter what you do in your life, you're gonna experience suffering. And a lot of it can be, determined by what you do, but the fact is, no matter how good you are, no matter what things you do, you're gonna experience suffering in your life. Why? Because of natural, it's a natural law that we're all going to experience suffering. Back to the, back to the dentist, we, you, everyone has to go to the dentist because of natural decay. For people who don't take very good care of their teeth, you're feeding the bacteria in your mouth sugars that allow the bacteria to produce acid that actually eat your teeth away. And no matter what happens, that process is going to continue and we're all going to have to experiencing the suffer, experience the suffer, suffering of the dentist, uh, well, for the rest of our lives until we lose our teeth <laughs> and then we get dentures, which I'm pretty sure you probably still have to go in and get those checked out too. So, anyways, <laughs> we'll come back to this illustration later. But I first want to deal with a couple of the main ways that the world has dealt with suffering. The first being, uh, there's people who see the suffering in the world and they see it as evidence that either God does not exist. Or if he does exist, he obviously does not care about the suffering that goes on in the world. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, these people are called atheists, the people that believe that God could not possibly <coughs> exist. And uh, I read an article in the Huffington Post that an atheist wrote about suffering. And here's just a quote from this article. It says, of course, people find people of faith regularly, regularly assure one another that God is not responsible for human suffering. But how else can we understand the claim that God is both omniscient and omnipotent? There is no other way, and it is time for sane human beings to own up to this. This is the age-old problem of theodicy, of course, and we should consider it solved. If God exists, either he can do nothing to stop the most agrarious calamities, or he does not care to. Consequently, only the atheist is compassionate enough to take the profundity of the world's suffering at face value. It is terrible that we all die and lose everything we love. It is doubly terrible that so many human beings suffer needlessly while alive. This quote, it really, you know, in one sense it convicted me because this atheist, while, while he does not acknowledge that God exists, he acknowledges the fact that there needs to be a, this element of compassion in the world to deal with suffering at face value. And a lot of times when we encounter the issue of suffering, we want to, you know, answer the why. And, you know, Christians can usually come to suffering and they say, well, this is why suffering. But it's, they can answer the why, but they don't deal with the suffering at face value. They don't just say, they don't just, you know, they don't have the compassion to just embrace the suffering in the world that they see. And so in one sense, the atheist is right. The atheist is right. There needs to be this element of compassion present, present in order to deal with suffering at face value. However, some of you in here might believe God exists. Some of you might not. But let's just assume for a moment that God does exist. 
And um, if he does exist, many of you maybe have this understanding that if God exists, then suffering is simply the result of my own sins, where I am being punished by God for the sins that I have committed. And the common view of sin, we need to discuss this, because if suffering is the result of my sin, I need to understand what sin is. And, you know, we have this idea that sin is, are the wrong things that I commit. If you're a kid and you lie to your mom, that's a sin. You cheat on a test. Man, I, I cheated in so many tests when I was growing up. I didn't really understand, you know, how wrong it was, but, like, that's a sin, and that's something that I had to answer for. Uh, and I, it caused suffering for me when I would get in trouble with my teachers. Uh, but, uh, so we, we always have this idea that sin is, are these things that we commit, but we need to understand sin as a greater, it's bigger than just the things that we do. See, the truth is that sin is not just something that you do, but sin is separation from God. And the Bible talks about how when Adam and Eve, uh, the first human beings created, when they were in the Garden of Eden, they, they first sinned when God told them, he told them not to eat from the fruit of the tree, but they did it anyway, and that that not only was it a wrong thing for them to do, but it, it created this, this sin nature in us. All of us who are, who are descendants of Adam and Eve, we have this sin nature inside of us. And this is what we are living in, regardless of what you do or what you do not do. We all have this tendency to sin. And, and Romans says that for all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Adam and Eve's original sin in the garden allowed sin to enter the world. And this brought a curse on everything in nature. So some of the things that we experience in life are not necessarily the result of the individual sins that you have committed. They're not just the result of, you know, I cheated on a test and so now I'm suffering, but they're just the result of the sin nature that we are all living in and we're all born into. Back to the dentist illustration, some of you, you suffer because of your lack of care for your teeth, but some of you just suffer because you have poor enamel and it's not something that you chose. Um, my dad, he takes amazing care of his teeth, but he has the worst enamel. He's, all, he, he's like eating a sandwich once. I remember when I was a kid, he was eating a sandwich and he broke a tooth and he had to go get like a root canal. It was, it was awful. And I, I, in one sense, it's like, wow, that's not fair. Like he takes this amazing care of his teeth. And for me, I had, I had pretty good enamel. I was boasting in my enamel. I was like, I can bring any soda that I want. You know, I eventually reap the benefits of that. But uh, is that fair? It doesn't seem fair. And that's the, that's the question we need to come to is that even if suffering is a result of our sin, it still doesn't seem fair to us because a lot of the stuff, all of the suffering that we experience is the result of this greater sin nature. It's because of our great grandfather Adam who, who allowed sin to enter the world. And certainly it doesn't seem fair, but I want to use this other illustration to just illustrate this point for you. But suffering is like getting pulled over on the freeway. Um, you know, just imagine you're driving in your car, you're keeping up with the flow of traffic, you're just going the same speed as everybody else, and then the cop pulls you over. Is, is that fair? Does it seem fair? It's like, no, everyone else, they were flying past me, but I was the one that got pulled over. But the truth is, you were breaking the law. You are speeding. So the way that sin works is like nobody is able to drive the speed limit. Nobody is able to obey the law. And we are all living in this state where we are constantly disobeying the law. And it's, while it might not seem fair how this punishment is, is, is distributed, in one sense, it's because of the sin nature that we're all living in. So nobody is capable of driving the speed limit. We all have a tendency to sin, and we all do sin. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So suffering is a natural byproduct of the sin that we are all born into. And this is where we find ourselves. Suffering is the result of our sin, and all will suffer because we all live with this sinful nature. But even once we answer this question of why suffering, even once we establish that suffering is the result of sin, we still find ourselves asking why. If not why suffering, then why me? Or why, why, why do I see suffering in the world? There's so many examples of suffering that just seem so unjust. Children who grow up in families without parents, children whose, whose parents are addicted to drugs or alcohol, or you know this conflict in Syria, all these people being displaced or, or killed because of civil war. And it doesn't seem fair, especially for us living here, where we see all the suffering and we say, how could God allow this to happen? And it's not, it's, it seems so wrong to say that, wow, these people are suffering because of the sin that they have committed, or the sin that they're living in. That doesn't, even, that doesn't seem fair to us at all. And some of us are asking the question, if we all have a sinful nature, then why is it that I seem to be suffering more than those around me? And this is the question that we all have to deal with. Sunday morning, 
I woke up at about 5.30 in the morning. My alarm did not go off. Uh, it was way too early. My alarm wasn't supposed to go off for like another two hours. Anyways, that's the point. My, my, I woke up feeling like I had been spinning in a chair. Like somebody had literally put me in a chair and was spinning me around. And I had, I had no idea what was going on. I woke up. My room is completely dark. I had to turn on the light just to get a, like a point of reference to see like what is up right now. Like literally, what is up? So I turned on the light and my eyes were doing the thing where like I was focusing on the light and it was like skipping back like this and I had no idea what was going on. So I did what everybody does in these types of situations. I called my mom. <laughs> I woke her up and I was like, hey, what's up, mom? She's like, what's going on? I'm like, uh, I just feel really dizzy right now. And it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty awful. Um, no matter what I did, no matter what position I put myself in, I just, I was feeling, I was starting to get nauseous, like sick to my stomach. And it was, you know, while it's, it's kind of a diminished form of suffering because I'm, there's so much suffering in the, in the world and this is very, just this a small thing, but it, in that moment, I felt like I was suffering. And my mom, she said this thing to me, she said, do you need me to come and take you to, to go to the doctor? My mom lives in Chehalis, for, for any of you who don't know where that is, it's almost 100 miles away. And it's 5.30 in the morning. And my mom said, I will come to you and I will take you to go get, to go get help. And at that moment, I was just, call me mama's boy or whatever, I don't care. I was, I was moved. Like, there's, there's been these points in my, in my life where I have like, been so moved by the compassion that my parents have for me. And this was one of those moments where I, I would never have expected that she would say, I will come and get you where you're at. But just that feeling of the love and compassion that she had for me because she was willing to come where I was in that situation. And I, I started to cry actually. It, it, guys don't like to admit that, so. But part of it, I was tired and I was super frustrated, but just moved by the fact that she would be willing to come and meet me where I'm at in the midst of my suffering. And this is the picture that I think that we need to keep in mind when, when we think of God, where God sees the suffering in the world. God sees you in your suffering. And not only that, but God suffered for you. God suffered for you and now he's with you in the midst of your suffering. So where my mom was willing to drive 100 miles to meet me in the midst of my suffering, the God of the universe was willing to go way further than that, way further than that to meet you in the midst of your suffering. So you might not know why you're suffering. You might not have all the answers. But I want to encourage you that if you turn to Jesus, Jesus is the one who came and suffered for you, and he's the one that will comfort you in the midst of your suffering. God is a loving father who cares for his children. And, you know, I obviously don't have kids, but I remember being a kid, and whenever I'd feel sick, my parents aren't doctors. I would go to my parents, I'd say, I'm, I'm feeling sick, and they would care for me. They don't necessarily fix the problem, but, they, but their presence with me was what, what comforted me in that situation. So God, that's, that's what our God does. Our God, sometimes he doesn't necessarily solve the problem. He doesn't fix the suffering in our life, but he is there in the midst of it. And that's what I want to tell you today is that if you are suffering, Jesus is enough for you in your suffering. Jesus is your comfort and your peace. So right now, I just want to ask everyone in here if you just bow your heads. And I want to challenge you in two ways. First of all, for those of you who would say, my life is going great. I haven't really experienced suffering in my life. The Bible gives very clear instruction for you. While you might, might not be suffering yourself, Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those re who, re who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Your responsibility is to be there for those who are suffering. Your responsibility is to identify with them. And then it, the Bible gives even more instruction. It says, True religion is caring for widows and orphans. And we can make that way more broad. We can say that really, true religion is just caring for those in need. And finally, if you find yourself today in a place where you are suffering... I just want to encourage you that Jesus is enough for you in your suffering. I just want to encourage you to turn to Jesus. He's the one who offers compassion and comfort to those in need. He's the one who suffered for you and is with you in the midst of your suffering. And right now, if you are willing to allow Jesus to enter your situation, if you are willing to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, I just want to have you just lift up a, lift up a hand so I can pray for you. Lord God, I just thank you so much for the fact that you came, Lord, that you suffer suffered for us, Lord God, and that you are in the midst of our suffering. The Bible says you are Emmanuel, you are God with us, Lord, and we just embrace that truth this morning, God, that you love us, Lord, and that you 
care for us in the midst of our suffering, Lord. And while we, not, while we may not understand the why, Lord, we don't understand why is it me that has to suffer, Lord God, but we can understand that you care for us in the midst of that, Lord, that you, went, that you, you came and suffered for us, Lord. We just embrace that truth this morning. And Lord, I pray um, on behalf of all these people, Lord God, who just raise their hands, Lord God, that they want to accept you, Lord. I just pray that you would just enter their life, Lord God, enter their situation, show them that you are more than enough for them, Lord. As they, and as they begin this journey with you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Blake.